All right, uh, thanks, and uh, hi, everyone. So, uh, as she mentioned, I am John Schneider. Fargo 3D printing is what, uh, what I've started in Fargo, North Dakota. Not the most exciting name on Earth, but it certainly is descriptive. Uh, so, a little background on me. I have always been, I've always been entrepreneurially owned, in mind. Uh, ever since I can remember when I was younger, I'd always try and convince my younger siblings that they should buy into whatever business I was thinking of starting. Uh, so this went on from, I don't know, from, from a very young age. And then in eighth grade, I actually took action on some of these ideas. So I was always that kid that had the weird, sort of strange hobbies. Some of them technical, some of them just, like I said, weird. And in eighth grade, I became the first beekeeper that I knew uh, at that age. So I had been reading a book in public library about hobby farming. I grew up on a farm, we weren't actively farming anymore, I thought, okay, we've got all this space, how can I take advantage of this? And there was a chapter in that book on beekeeping. So I did that for three years until I headed off to college. Uh, another example is um, I had a business buying and selling Legos. Now, like I said, I've always been a geek. So Legos are something you think of, okay, I was younger, you know, age six to 12, that's kind of that main range. There's not a whole lot of high school seniors that have an extensive Lego collection. Uh, turns out there's an entire industry built around just that, so there's a niche for absolutely anything. Um, so I graduated from NDSU in 2012 with a marketing degree, and when I graduated, I thought, okay, what sort of industries are out there that are and that have a really they have a high growth potential? I look back at desktop computing in the 80s and 90s and thought it would have been great to be alive and, and you know, I guess, business age when I was, you know, that kind of stuff was going on. And 3D printing is one of the things I gravitated for. My business partner, Jake Clark, he has a design and drafting background and he used 3D printing at his first job out of school. And he was approached by a company, MakerBot, asking, okay, we think that you're really knowledgeable about this stuff and you should start selling these. Jake came to me, I agreed, and uh, the rest is kind of history. So, okay, a little quick background on who uses 3D printing. It has been around for quite a while, been around since the mid-80s. It was used a lot for rapid prototyping. So, it was used in industrial design for many years. So, it helps reduce the amount of time it takes to create a prototype, and that helps to reduce costs. Now, these machines were very expensive, and the parts weren't very strong, but they served their purpose. Now 3D printing is used for many different applications. It's used by racing teams to develop custom parts, and these parts can be made in metal. So metal 3D printing is something that's, that's relatively new. Um, 3D printing in space. Last year they put a 3D printer up on the International Space Station. Those tests have been going very well, and now they're developing a 3D printer that will exist outside of the International Space Station so they can start 3D printing structures in space. So now you can have objects that wouldn't make sense to launch into space because they wouldn't be able to survive the launch, but now you can build them, and that's going to give us a head start on getting to places like the moon, Mars, and beyond. Industrial design, as I mentioned, that's been a big one. Architecture is another really big one. Uh, on the stage here, you can see that there's a model of a cathedral. This is something that would be very difficult to model any other way. That's not to say it's not impossible, but with this, you just get your design, click, go, or print on a 3D printer, and 24 hours later you have a finished model. And biomedical is another big area where 3D printing is starting to take off. So in the next 10 to 15 years, you'll be able to say, all right, I need a kidney, 3D print me a kidney. Uh, it might take a little bit longer than that for FDA approval, but it's something that's starting to happen now. They're able to 3D print that kind of tissue now, and the development just keeps on getting more and more advanced. So a little background on the difference between Fargo 3D printing and 3DM USA. Fargo 3D printing started a little over a year and a half ago. Uh, 3D printer sales, custom 3D printing, printer training. We manufacture spare and replacement parts for 3D printers as well. And then 3DM USA is something that we spun off, and that manufactures the materials that the 3D printers use. So this type of 3D printer uses something called film. Think of it like a specialized weed whacker string. A 3D printer is basically a really advanced hot glue gun on a robotic gantry. It heats the plastic up, pushes it out through the nozzle, and then builds up an object layer by layer. So we started 3 d USA about a year ago, and we focus on eco-friendly materials. That material I was just holding in my hands is made using 
corn-based plastic and things that are left over from the coffee roasting process. So it's utilizing something that otherwise would have been thrown away. It's also made from 100% renewable resources. Even the spool that it's loaded onto, that tan colored on here, that's made from vinyl plastics as well. That's a combination of corn-based plastic and stuff that's left over from processing flax. And our customers, we have a variety of customers. So we do sell directly to people that already have a 3D printer, but we also do custom private labeling and white labeling for larger customers. There are companies out there that all they do is buy and sell 3D printer from them. Very similar to when I had the label business, it's definitely a niche. 3D printer filament has its own niche. And a lot of these companies want to have their own spool. They want to have something that they can label as their own, but they don't want to acquire the knowledge it takes to manufacture this. They don't want to have a manufacturing facility. They just want to have their filament with the name on it. So we do private labeling for those customers. They tend to be high volume, low margin, but it keeps the machine running. And of course, 3D printer manufacturers. Any, any company that manufactures a 3D printer, they also need to be selling the materials that the 3D printers use. That's another opportunity for white labeling, or in some cases, they want to just recommend a brand. They don't, they want to recommend our brand. They don't care about having their own name on the film. They just want to make sure it's something that works and works well. So we have overcome a lot to get to the point where we're at now. One of the biggest things has been raising capital. Manufacturing equipment is not cheap, and this is not just a little, you know, a little short production line. This takes up a uh, 2,000 plus square foot facility, and it's a 60 foot long manufacturing line. So to get all of this to happen was was very challenging. Getting a business plan put together, going and approaching banks to to acquire financing, taking advantage of the different programs that uh, the state of North Dakota has to offer. Trying to coordinate all that was a challenge. Um, I know Jared was mentioning Innovate ID. That has been absolutely instrumental in helping us accomplish this. Working with uh, Dr. Jeff Stamp, getting our business idea distilled down. When we first came, or when we went to our first boot camp, we had a lot of ideas. Not all of them were good, and we we're sort of all over the place. And those boot camps helped to really figure, you know, help us figure out who we were, what we were trying to accomplish, so that we weren't focusing on too many things. Another thing is systems systems and more systems. We're starting to get to a point where we're going to grow rapidly and right now we spend a lot of time being busy but not always getting things done. So what we're starting to do now is putting more emphasis on the systems that we have in place so that we don't spend all of our time just doing busy work. We want to make sure that we're spending time actually developing and growing the business. Strategic partnerships have also been a very big deal for us. I'll get to that on the next slide but this copy-based material has gotten us a lot of attention. We've been featured on CNET, we've been in a lot of coffee industry blogs, a lot of 3D printing industry blogs, and we wouldn't have been able to do that if we were just making regular corn-based plastic. Adding that coffee to be able to tell that story has been, has been huge, and that's been as a result of those partnerships. And one of the big challenges we have now is just managing growth. So as you start having more customers, you need to have more capital so you can make the product for those additional customers, and it seems like you're always just one month behind on things. So trying to manage that so that we grow not too quickly, but so that we continue to grow, that's, that's always a challenge for us. Some of the strategic partnerships, I mentioned C2 Renew. They're a company based in Fargo. They specialize in biocomposites, and particularly they specialize in using agricultural waste products. So things that are left over from processing sunflower, processing coffee, uh, even even beer grains, for example, that is another one we're looking at. Um, they help to combine those materials with other plastics to either help lower costs or to help better tell a story. Dynapurge is another material that we, uh, or another partnership that we have. Dynapurge is really well known in the plastics industry as a purge material, the material that's used to clean out the processing equipment. What we've been able to do with that partnership is get more attention from the plastics industry and having them look more at 3D printing just because of that. And then 3M Europe. So we have a partnership with a company in Ireland that is now called 3M Europe. And they, so what that enables us to do is have manufacturing facilities in North America, but also in Europe so we can satisfy local markets. So that's been a very key partnership. They also helped us learn a lot more about 3D printer filament manufacturing. 
So what's next for Fargo 3D printing and 3 New materials. So in the next two weeks, we're anticipating we'll be releasing a, and this isn't public knowledge yet, so don't throw a hashtag on this one, or maybe don't tweet this one out, but we're coming out with a beer-based filament. So coffee was one of the very first five deposits. Beer-based is going to be the next one, and I believe that one's going to get us a bit of attention as well. Uh, glass filled PLA is another material we've come out with. The thing with this industry is you can't just produce one material and continue producing the same thing because prices are starting to go down. Certain materials are becoming a commodity. It doesn't, it doesn't really matter who makes it, just whoever produces it for the cheapest, that's who's going to get the customers. So we need to be innovating with new materials to make sure that, to make sure we're not just another 3D printer filament manufacturer. Increase white label customers. The great thing about white label customers is they help you keep the lights on. You're not making a whole lot of money on each spool, but you're more than covering your costs. You're still having a profit, and it's allowing you to reap more profits on specialized materials instead of barely breaking even on specialized materials. We want to keep the production lines running 24-7 if possible, not 1-7 or 24-1 even. You want to make sure that it's always running. And adding production capacity, that's something that to satisfy some of these white label customers we need to do in the next 12 to 24 months. So I want to thank you for, uh, for listening to me, and I'm looking forward to your questions. If you want to get in touch with me, my cell number, email address are on there, and the uh, Twitter handles for Fargo 3D Printing and 3D USA are pretty simple. It's just that, no spaces. So, thank you.
it is. The copy-based stuff generates a lot of leads for us. Even if someone comes to the website and they don't purchase, we, um, we do have something set up through lead pages where as they leave the site, um, they have this little information bubble that pops up and says, hey, we're coming out with a new material soon. Do you want to learn? Do you want to know when this material comes out? And then they enter their email address. So even if we don't have them convert on the site that first time, it means that we still have an opportunity to reach out to them and have them convert later on. Reagan, Reagan, with respect to the user experience, let's say if there's something <laughs> using copy, base, peer base, or other types of development uh, that also are you still looking for investment companies? So there is uh, there is a little bit more of it's not quite as fire and forget as standard PLA is, and it varies from material to material. But copy-based filament, for example, you need to print it about five degrees lower than PLA because it tends to ooze a little bit more. And uh, if, if the printer is oozing, it means it's going to leave little, well, kind of little boogers on the print, and that's not really ideal. So it means you're going to have to spend more time in post-processing to clean that stuff up. Um, so each of the each of the non-standard materials has its own little quirks, but we put recommendations on the website for all those different materials to give people as good of a starting point as it can. Uh, as far as the investment side goes, it's something that we've been, uh, something we've been toying with. We've, we've been trying to figure out if if we accept outside investment, how much more will that help us to 